All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us in person and online for this next session in the capital raising series of the Founder University Bootcamp. So we're really excited for this. We're gonna have Leif Martin here is gonna be uh, talking to us about initiating your raise, finding the right mentors, guidance, and other things you need to know before you start with a special emphasis on the mentorship capacity. Uh, but a little bit about Leith. Uh, Leith is actually a team member of ours. He's recently joined. He's a senior team member in charge of deal flow, and he's also one of the GPs in our various funds. Um, Leith is also the executive director for the Troche Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the UNLV Lead Business School, where he oversees entrepreneurship programs, including the Rebel Venture Fund, the UNLV National Science Foundation i program, and a bunch of other uh, academic and entrepreneurship curriculum. Uh, Leith has a uh, bachelor's in mechanical engineering and an MBA from the University of Alabama, uh, and he chose the entrepreneurship over multiple offers from Fortune 100 companies. He took over a company called Turnip Seed International in 1999, leading to its growth and expanding to India and Mexico and achieving, on average, 100% annual growth for eight years in a row. Uh, in 2007, Leith was admitted to the Owners and Operator, Owners and Presidents Managers Program, or the OPM program at Harvard Business School. The OPM is a program by Harvard Business School specifically designed for entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs. Uh, he relocated to Las Vegas in uh, 2010, and he co-founded Equinet, a technology company. Uh, Equinet has customers across the United States, in China, as and uh, Western Europe. And without much further ado, Leith, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it, as always, and uh, I'll let you take it away now. Logan, thank you. That was incredibly formal, uh, <laughs> much more formal than I expected. So thanks for doing that. My kids have a term, um, and, and it's funny how different generations use different terms. Um, and my kids have a term that they use that's become much more common in pop popular culture. Uh, and sometimes I, I think that uh, in this particular work, uh, this particular term is incredibly, um, it sounds exactly like it feels. And when people read your bio, there's nothing short, it feels cringy, right? And so that's my kid always say, I always think that when somebody's reading your bio and you're standing there, it's a cringy situation. So um, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, um, all right, thanks for being here today. As Logan mentioned, um, I've got a couple of different roles. I, I run the Center for Entrepreneurship at UNLV called the Troche Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. We're an academic unit inside the business school. Um, but I also have stepped in recently um, and helped starting manage some of the deal flow for the accelerator. It's a natural fit. The reality was is there was a ton of deals that just connected to me because my role at UNLV and I was able to connect them to Logan at, at, at Startup NV and now it just makes a lot more sense. And the other thing that I think is incredibly helpful is there's one of the biggest issues historically we've had in Las Vegas, in my opinion, is fragmentation across different organizations. And now we're starting to pull together some of those organizations in a more effective way with what the LVGA is doing, what the city is doing, what the county is doing, what Startup NV is doing, and also UNLV. So I think there's a great deal of potential. All right, so let's talk about mentorship. First of all, so let's let's set up the, the, the discussion today. If you have a question, interrupt me. Even if you're online, unmute, yell, we'll work it out, right? So don't, this isn't uh, aimed to be uh, me talking for 30 minutes and you guys listening. Now, uh, if you have a question at any given point, please interrupt me. Secondly, um, you can take notes if you want, but I'll give Audrey a copy of this deck and she'll email it to everyone that showed up. So you'll get a copy of the deck as well. So you're welcome to take notes, um, but you'll get a copy of the deck if you actually want a copy of that as well. So, all right, so let's talk about mentorship. Now, I think that, uh oh, I'm already frozen. There we go. All right. So I, I, the context of this particular discussion is, is around mentorship in general, and then we'll focus a little more as we go on about financial in terms of raising around or things like that. But, but let's talk a little bit about mentorship in general. Um, mentorship in the context of startups is very different than mentorship than you might see inside an organization, right? So if I work for a big company, I might have a mentor in the company and they might tell me the, the, the direction that I might take to be successful inside that organization. Um, it might be a retention program built by the company. So if you have mentors, you're more likely to stay with the company longer term. Whereas startup mentorship is typically very different. Um, the, the context with which startup founders need mentorship is very different. The type of information that they, you can exchange is oftentimes very different. And so startup for mentorship is, I think, somewhat unique. Um, you should consider mentors as advisors and guides. They're not coaches. They're not... Um, consultants that you hire to work with you. That's not what mentors are. 
Um, those are transactional based and they're more specifically around a specific project or a specific mission in which you've hired that consultant or that coach. In the case of mentors, it's a very different relationship, okay? The other problem that you have if you kind of use consultants or coaches to kind of build your mentorship pool, the problem with that is they pay, you pay them. And so you're not gonna get the type of information or the, have the type of relationship that you would hope to have that you would have with a mentor. And then finally, mentors roles provide insights, knowledge, networking, and opportunities. And we'll talk about some of that as we go on. All right, so some of the benefits to having a mentor, specifically in the context of a startup environment, okay? So um, the reality is, is they can accelerate the learning and growth that you have because the re the, what typically happens is the way that you learn is by typically doing, especially in the startup world, as opposed to more of an academic approach. And so by talking to someone who already has a lot of that experience, then they can accelerate the speed with which you can grow and the speed with which you can learn. Um, the other thing is, is they can help you avoid major mistakes, right? They may have already experienced those mistakes. And so they're basically like, look, I did this. Let me tell you what happened to me. Don't do what I did, right? So you can learn from those mistakes. The problem with the startup community or startup, the startup world is big mistakes can be fatal to the company. Um, especially in the early stages. So avoiding those common pitfalls or making those major mistakes is a big deal in terms of your early stage or your early stage company or your early stage in your career or your early stage company. So they can help you avoid those big mistakes. Um, they also give you wider access to networks. One of the big advantages of raising money is that not only do you get access to capital, but oftentimes those investors bring their network. And the same is true of a mentor, right? So you may go to your mentor with a question, say, I'm really not sure what to do in this particular situation. They might say, hey, I don't know either, but I know someone who knows. Um, and that might be incredibly valuable. In my own experience, um, uh, in some of the in two specific instances of companies I've started, one, the first company I was ever involved in, my business partner was 25 years older than I was. Um, and that was actually a really big deal because for me, he had lots of experience. Um, our, our particular interests were aligned, success of the company. So I, I, um, I, I, could, I, I didn't have to worry about whether or not what he was telling me was accurate because he was a business partner. Um, but also he taught me something really early on that actually changed the course of my career. And um, keep in mind that when I started my career in the late 90s, you know, email was used, people had just started getting cell phones. Um, but I'll never forget, I kept going to my business partner. I'd say, hey, what do you think about this customer? Do you think they would do this? Or do you think they want this? Or do you think this? And he was like, Leith, I don't have any idea. Why don't you just call and ask them? And I remember thinking that, wow, that seems incredibly simple. Um, but it was something I learned early is that I can either wonder forever or make mistakes or I can find someone that knows and I can ask them the question and learn in five minutes what it might take me a year to figure out and lots of money and lots of time. So I've used that advice throughout my entire career. I just find people that know the answer and, and I figure out what the answer is by asking people. So getting access to a wider network through a mentor is a big deal, right? You're leveraging not only what your mentor knows, but all the people that your mentor knows, all right? You also have increased confidence and resilience. Sometimes um, we don't make decisions or we don't move forward because we're not sure what the correct decision is. And the reality is, is mentor can provide advice or other things that give us more confidence in those decisions that we make. And we can move forward with more action. And that's a big deal as well, right? Uh, if, you, uh, if you don't know what choice to make, you stall and you don't make a decision. If you're more likely to have good advice on one side or the other, you can make a decision and move forward with more confidence. And then finally, their objectives, they provide objective feedback and accountability. Right. So one of the big advantages of mentors, is they will say things like, hey, last month when we met, you said you were going to do X. Did you do that? Right. That accountability is something that we we oftentimes need. I'll, I'll never forget my uh, he's now older. But my when my son was 16, one of my sons were 16. He came to me one time. He said, Dad, you know, I'm really struggling. Like I I try to work out and, you know, I do it for a certain period of time and then I stop doing it. And, you know, I, I, I'm committed for a week and then I, my commitment level falls off in week two or three or whatever. Right. And I, I, I told him, I said, look, everyone, 50 year olds are struggling with commitment and self accountability. Right. So this isn't unique to a 16 year old. This is everyone struggles with these kind of things. And sometimes having someone hold you accountable is incredibly important. And so I talked to him about things that you can do to improve your particular accountability by going to the gym. 
get a partner that you work out with, right? Set a specific time that you get it done and certain goals so that you can achieve short-term goals that lead to long-term goals. So there's things that you can do, but a mentor can hold you accountable, which is incredibly important because here's what happens. You know, you have a meeting coming up with your mentor. You know what you said last time. You know what you said you were going to do. Pretty good chance you're going to go do those things before the next meeting because you don't want to go and say, I didn't do any of those things, right? So just having that accountability, meaning someone that you have to talk to that you told you were going to do certain things makes you more accountable and more likely to do those things. So that's why a mentor is also important in that case. Um, so how to approach and establish a mentor-mentee relationship? You know, this can sometimes be tricky, right? Um, the reason it can be tricky is that you don't necessarily know for sure if their goals are aligned with your goals, right? And the truth is, is oftentimes mentorship is a little bit charitable on the mentor side, right? Because the reality is, is they may or may not receive direct value from that. And the irony is, is that if you provide them some sort of value for that mentorship, then you've now biased the relationship in some way that the information might not be as free flowing as it is if it's not biased. Right? Um, as I mentioned, I, 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 I've had business partners that I um, deemed as mentors, and the advantage of that was that they were much older, and they had lots of experience, um, and our, our interests were aligned, because I could say to them, hey, what do you think about this? I mean, how do I handle this? And we both were trying to make the company as valuable as possible, so our interests were aligned, right? Um, so choose a mentor who aligns with your goals and values. Try to figure out what you're trying to accomplish with a mentor. And then use that information to help figure out what your mentor or who your mentor should be. Am I trying to find a mentor that has expertise specifically around fundraising? Okay, great. Then try to align your, your, your mentorship, trying to find a mentor, or mentor around those specific goals and people that have those types of experiences. Um, initiate contact with a clear and concise message. Um, I, I mentioned I work in a university environment. Um, and lots of people reach out to me and say, hey, can we meet? And sometimes they reach out to me and say, hey, can I help? And in the beginning, um, I didn't know what that meant. Um, because if I'm in the private sector and someone calls me and said, hey, can we meet? Then I usually know in some way, more than likely money is involved. Right? Can you connect me with so-and-so because I want to get a referral from you? Can you, um, are you a potential customer of mine? You know, Whatever that may be. But in the academic world, I didn't know what that meant because people would come to me and say, yeah, can I help? And I, we'd have a great conversation. At the end, I was like, yeah, sounds great. And I don't know what anybody was going to do. Right. And so being clear about what the message is, if you're looking for a mentor, for example, um, be very specific on what you're looking for um, so that everyone is on the same page. A mentor should never not know that they are a mentor. Right. Um, if you want them to be a mentor, they should know they're a mentor because they're going to treat that experience very differently. Be respectful of their time and availability, right? So if you are reaching out to someone that you think will be a mentor, you might want to even say, look, in terms of commitment and time from your standpoint, I'm looking for maybe a one hour coffee meeting once a month, right? Just something like that and be sure that you're clear into what your expectations are. Because if someone hears mentor, they may think, well, they may want to meet with me every day, right? And so be sure to be clear on what you're hoping to gain from that. Um, express genuine interest in learning from them. This is a really fancy way to say, listen, you're incredibly, uh, your experience is incredibly valuable to me. I'm trying to uh, follow in some ways the career that you path that you've taken, blah, 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 whatever those things may be. You may include things in that introduction that for lack of a better term would fall into the category of I would call sales, right? We've all done sales calls and there's certain things that we say when we're doing a sales call that might butter up for lack of a better term, the person that we're trying to get to take the meeting, right? And if you're trying to find a mentor, you might say, look, you've got tons of experience in this industry. I've, I've seen your profile on LinkedIn. I'm impressed by the things you've accomplished. Um, I'm, I'm looking to potentially have a mentor in this industry um, it, can we just meet to discuss? I'm thinking it's maybe going to be once a month in terms of a, a short meeting, whatever that may be, but be clear and concise in terms of your, your reach out. Um, and in that initial meeting, um, uh, or set up the initial meeting to discuss the specifics in terms of expectations, right? No one should be ambiguous as to what the expectations are 
in terms of what you're asking for. They're more than likely going to turn you down if they don't know what your expectations are because they're going to think it, it doesn't matter what we think. But, well, okay, that's not true. It doesn't matter what our time commitments actually are. We think they are much more than they are. Um, we're like, man, we're busy. Oof, got a lot going on. And the truth is, is what does that even mean? I, you know, I was awake for 20 or I was awake for 18 hours. Like I didn't do something every 18 hours, uh, every hour for 18 hours. So, but the reality is, is we all perceive that we're busy. And so if we think that we might be more of a commitment than we're willing to take on, then we're going to say no. All right. So establishing clear expectations and boundaries, right? So clearly defined goals and objectives of the mentors. You, know, you might want to list the goals or things that you want to accomplish in terms of the mentorship relationship. I'm hoping to find work with someone who's got experience raising venture capital. And as a result of that, I know you've raised a lot in your career. Can you help me through this process? Um, I'm, I, I'm, you've been very successful as a leader inside the industry and inside your company. And I'm looking for a mentor that can help me specifically with leadership skills. Can you help me with that, right? So be clear in what you're defining and your outcomes in terms of your mentorship. Discuss frequency and mode of communication, right? How often do you want to meet? How long do you want to meet? And how do you want to meet? Do you want to meet in person? Do you want to meet on Zoom? Do you want to meet via phone call? What does that look like for them? Because that helps them decide what their commitment level is going to have to be, okay? Respect your mentor's time and commitments. You're going to get emails that are going to say, hey, I hate to do this, but I need to cancel this today or I need to move this meeting because I've got something to come up, right? Understand that in many ways, you know, they're being very charitable with their time. So you need to be understanding of those type of changes or commitments themselves. Set boundaries to ensure healthy and productive relationships. You know, I think that, um, you know, people become uncomfortable when the speed with which a relationship develops becomes what's perceived as a little too fast, right? If you show up randomly at their office, uh, you, they're uncomfortable, right? Especially if they've, you've met one time, right? Um, just be careful in the way that you interact with your mentor and be careful that you understand how the mentor should be interacting with you and make sure that those, that relationship is, is healthy and productive. Regularly re revisit and adjust expectations as needed. Right? So as I mentioned, one of the great things about a mentor is they're going to they're gonna hold you accountable, but those things that you should be working on may change over time. And the long-term goals may change over time. So be sure to continue to look at those and things that you want to get out of the mentorship relationship. And then more specifically, things that you should adjust based on things that you've accomplished and things that you're doing next, right? So always revisit those things. All right. So these are the qualities of a, of a successful mentor-mentee relationship. So open and honest communication. If you have a mentor that's... Um, Support, overly supportive, which is great, but overly supportive in the standpoint that everything you do is fantastic, then that's not a mentor. That's probably a parent in terms of the way that they would do it, right? So I don't know if you guys have ever sat through customer discovery classes when they talk about doing customer discovery or session, but I always say that the friends and families are liars, right? And they're not liars because they want to hurt your feelings. They're liars because they want to be supportive. And they also, they're, they're invested in your emotional well-being. So they try to say things like, yeah, I know you're working hard. Keep doing it. it sounds great. We think it's awesome. You need people to say, uh, this is done, right? Because you need to be, make adjustments based on what the real world thinks, not based on what your parents or your friends think, right? And the same is true of mentors. If mentors are overly supportive and never critical or never holding you accountable, then they're not a mentor. Um, and so keep that in mind as well. There needs to be honest and open communication between the two of you. Um, there needs to be willingness to learn and adapt, meaning how does the relationship continue to move? What do I need to learn from the relationship in terms of actual actionable items? And how do I adjust that over time? And what do we build in the, in the meetings so that we're continually changing and adapting based on the needs of me, the startup, or whatever it may be, right? You must have mutual respect and trust, meaning that that comes both ways, right? So mutual respect in the sense that you may have respect for the individual because of their accomplishments, but you also have to have enough respect that you actually trust the things that you say and are willing to act to create action on those things. And then they also have to trust you in the sense that if you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. And as a result of doing it, you're going to move yourself forward and potentially your startup forward, right? 
constructive feedback and active listening, they should be able to be open and you should be able to take that criticism. If you're defensive all the time, they're gonna stop providing the feedback. If you're like, no, I, well, I didn't do that. I, 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 that's not what I did. Well, okay, that may be true, but the reality is if that's the way every conversation goes, more than likely, it's not a mentor that's gonna stick with you because you're not listening. Um, there is a, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a unique trait I think in humans that when we're nervous or when we're accountable, we talk more. And we talk more because we're overselling and we're overselling because we're nervous. And so oftentimes you don't even realize that you're doing it. And so when people hold you accountable, sometimes you make excuses, you do all these different things. Well, the reality is, is that if you've made a mistake, you haven't done something, you need to be honest in the way that you, you've done that, all right? That over time will solidify the relationship in such a way that there will be an opportunity to have open and honest conversations, which are the most valuable to you. You don't need a cheerleader as a mentor. That's not true. You need a cheerleader in the sense that you want them to be positive and helpful, but you don't need someone that basically is a yes person. Your employees are going to do that for you most of the time, right? Um, you need someone that just is quite different. You also need someone that success uh, celebrates successes and learning from failures, right? So good mentors, kudos on that milestone. Good job, fantastic. Um, and when you fail, they don't beat you up about it, but they say things like, what can we learn from that? What are some things that you might do differently next time, right? They allow you to be reflective and then help you provide feedback or help provide feedback so that you can be more reflective in figuring out what those mistakes may have been. All right. So in terms of, let's talk a little bit more about finding a right mentor, right? So uh, you tap into your existing network first, right? So who do you have on LinkedIn? Who do you know? Who do your parents know? Who are the friends of your parents maybe? Because sometimes they may be in a situation in terms of later in life, more willing to do it, but also there may be already some sort of relationship there because there's a proxy relationship between you and them, okay? So you, you leverage your existing network. That's where you start first, right? Um, attend industry events and conferences. It's a great place to find mentors. Why? Because one, the irony is, is that when you go to events, people are already programmed to talk. If you've ever been to a convention, people will tell you everything. You walk up to their booth, and they'll tell you everything about the company. If you show up at their office and try to get that same level of information, there's zero chance. But because they're at a convention, they'll tell you the passwords, they'll tell you everything because they're trying to sell whatever they're doing, right? So you much more likely at those type of events to find someone that's opening, open and willing to communicate with you. And you might be able to find a mentor. You might say, look, you know a lot. Is there any way I can reach back out to you? Because I'm looking for somebody to help me on a couple of things. And maybe you can do that. And then you schedule a meeting and talk about that, right? Um, the other th great thing about these industry events and conferences is you meet so many different people that you can find people that you might interact with well, that you, for like, as I mentioned, my kids use lots of words. And one of the words they use now is you vibe with them, right? So in other words, there's lots of really great communication. Everybody's doing well. You might find people because you've talked to so many, you might find a few that you think could be potential mentors. Um, you know, you know, utilize online platforms and forums, right? So that's incredibly important as well. Just proximity or reach. The great thing about the, the video technology that exists, the bad thing about the video technology that exists is basically it's become a proxy for in-person. The great thing is, is because of distance, now you can access people that maybe you couldn't have accessed in the past because they weren't in your town. Um, at the university, we've had some phenomenal speakers that were willing to speak remotely, but I never could have flown them here from Boston or somewhere else to speak to a group of students, right? The same is true of mentors, right? The other thing is, is it's much less of an inconvenience now because everyone knows how to use the tech. So you get a, a, a potential mentor on the East Coast that will be willing to meet with you. They can just walk in their home office and sit down at Zoom and meet with you. Then you might be able to get really awesome mentors because the inconvenience is much lower for them. Um, and then finally, well, also approach mentor, potential mentors with a clear value proposition. We've kind of covered that a lot in, in some other, other points, but be persistent and patient in your search. And what I mean by that is, um, I heard this story the other day, and I think it's a perfect example in some ways of this. So I, I saw a short video, this young man was talking about, he had graduated with a degree in something like construction management. He was trying to get a job with this one particular company. 
I think there, there was a project in Baton Rouge. And so he was, he was going by this project every Friday, meeting with the security guard that ran, ran the gate and said, hey, you know, I have a copy of my resume. My name is John. I recently graduated from XYZ University. I have a degree in construction management. I love this company. I'd really like to work for this company. We give him a resume, right? He says, is there anyone I can meet with? He's like, no, there's really not, right? So the security guard blows him off. The next Friday, he shows up again, right? Same story. Here's my resume, blah, blah, blah. Goes to the spiel. Security guard's like, yeah, sounds great. Goes away, right? He does this three or four times. And after those three or four times, the security guard picks up the phone and calls the project manager on the job site. It's a $50 million job. Says, hey, dude, this guy keeps showing up. This young kid keeps showing up every week. And he's like, he drops off his resume every week. And the project manager just probably says something like, I tell you what, give me the resume next time I leave the job site, whatever, right? So he picks up a copy of the resume. He keeps going back, he keeps going back. And so the next thing you know, after about five or six weeks, the, he shows up and the guy says, hold on. So he picks up the phone, he calls the project manager. He said, okay, go in there. The job site trailer is right over there. Wherever. So he sits down in front of this project manager and the guy says, are you the guy that keeps going by my job site every week trying to shut this job down to meet with me? And he's like, yes, sir. And he said, man, I love it. Right. My point is, in general, the business community will reward persistence. Why? Because they like it. They love the fact that somebody is willing to be consistent and persistent in their chase for it to be successful. Because why? They may see that in themselves. Right. So you want to be persistent and you want to be patient. You don't want to be a stalker. Right. There's a fine line between being a stalker and, and maybe being uh, persistent. I'll use another example. I had a guy. I was looking at filling a role a few years ago. Well, this was, gosh, this was not a few years ago. It's probably 20 years ago in a company that I'd started. And I was looking for a salesperson. I hadn't quite decided whether or not I was going to hire a new project manager in sales for this group or a company. I placed the ad. I was like, I'll place the ad and see what kind of applicants I get. Um, you know, I interviewed 10 or 12 people, but really wasn't convinced if I was going to fill the role. So I was, Paul, I was, I was stalling. And one particular uh, candidate reached out to me a week later after the interviews and said, hey, I'm just following up on the interviews. Appreciate your time. Um, can you, uh, what's your update? Have you guys found someone? Have you already hired someone? I said, well, I haven't hired anyone. And I said, I'll be honest, I can't decide if I'm going to fill the role. And he said, look, I'd really like this job. I like this company. Um, keep me in mind. Um, do you think, when do you think you might make a decision? I was like, I don't know, give me a week. And he says, what time would be a good time to call? We said, he sets a date and time. On that date and time, he calls me. And he said, hey, my name is Chuck. He said, I'm just following up from last week. I'm just checking in if you made any decisions on that role. And I was like, I really haven't, I'm sorry. I said, give me two weeks this time. Two weeks later, he calls. A week after that, he calls on his defined time, right? I went to my business partner. I was like, we gotta get this guy a job. I mean, he does everything he says he's gonna do when he says he's gonna do it every single time. We offered the guy a job and ended up working for me for 12 years, right? And so in general, if you're persistent, respectfully persistent, you'll eventually get somebody's attention, right? Um, so just keep that in mind when you're trying to find someone. The other thing is, is that I'll never forget, I had a young man that came to me and he wanted to start a company. And um, he was like, he was a business partner. He said, I'm looking for a business partner, a co-founder. And I said, well, where have you looked? And he was like, well, not many places, but I can't figure out where to go. And I said, go to meetups, go to this, go to that. And after about two weeks, he came back and said, I haven't found a co-founder. And I was like, he was in his, he was probably 30. And I said, are you married? He said, like, yeah. I said, how long did it find, take you to find a partner to marry? And he was like, I don't know, I guess five or six years. I said, okay, you're not going to find, you're marrying someone in this business. It's going to take you a little longer than a week or two to find that person. So be patient in trying to find the right fit, right? All right. Tips for effective mentorship. Be proactive in seeking advice. Come prepared with specific questions. This is key. If the mentor feels like you're wasting their time, they're going to cut it off. So if you encounter situations during the previous three or four weeks, write them down. So when you show up, that one hour is filled with information in terms of what you're trying to learn. Actively listen and be receptive to feedback. That goes back to my comment before. Don't talk too much. Don't be defensive. Listen to what they're saying. Um, actually do stuff. Implement actionable, uh, uh, implement the actionable advice and track the progress. Since last time we spoke, you recommended that I do this weekly meeting. And I've done that weekly meeting for the last four weeks. Here are the outcomes of that, right? So whatever that may be. And then obviously express gratitude and appreciation, right? If, if, if you're ungrateful, they're going to stop meeting with you. Um, 
I don't mean, you know, overdo it, but definitely be appreciative because they're basically donating their time to help you, right? And these are a few things. Uh, oftentimes, I don't know, if, has anybody here ever worked with SCORE? You know, they have a mentorship program, right? So SCORE has a mentorship program. Oftentimes, the people that are in those me that are mentors are oftentimes corporate people, right? So lots of them have been successful, retired, and now are mentors, um, so for the startup community, sometimes it's a little bit of an awkward fit, but for a small business, it would probably be a pretty good fit in terms of score. But oftentimes, um, I'll reach out to people who have had experience with the school with score, for example, and some will be like, yeah, it was fantastic. And some will be like, yeah, it wasn't very good. And it's usually just around to the relationship with the mentor. It's not that the organization was bad. It was that the, the relationship maybe wasn't great with the mentor. Startup NV also has a mentorship program. Uh, Audrey does a great job. You can you can apply to have a mentor. She can help you try to find a mentor through our network. So it's another way to do that through Startup NV's network. So keep that in mind as well. So if you have misaligned goals and, and expectations, meaning that you didn't set those goals and expectations, how often are we going to meet? What are we going to talk about? Um, what kind of feedback can I expect? And how can I expect that feedback? If you email them 10 times a week, but your meeting is once a month, you know, whatever those expectations are, they need to be consistent. And if they're misaligned, it will create friction in the, in the mentorship relationship. Um, communication breakdowns, time constraints and conflicting schedules. Those are all things. Personality clashes. This is normally where mentorship fails. Their personality is different than yours, right? And also generational differences sometimes can be a bit of a struggle, right? The irony is, is people with more experience typically are, have the time to be mentors and they also have the experience that make them good mentors. But sometimes generational differences um, make it somewhat of a struggle to communicate effectively, right? Um, and then finally, strategies for addressing and resolving these issues, right? So what kind of strategies are you and your mentor going to have to overcome some of those potential issues that will take place? The truth is, is that mentors typically are willing to be mentors because they get value from the relationship. It, they feel good about the possibility of helping someone. And obviously the individual benefits from that experience oftentimes. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship, even though you may feel like a beggar um, because you're begging for time, you're begging for advice, but understand that there's typically value for the mentor as well. All right. All right, cool. Now, so this, not Q and A, but let me, let me end with one other thing. Um, some of the cool things that you can get out of mentorship, and I'll use this as a specific example. I, I remember one of the guys that um, originally was considering investing in a company that we'd started, but I spent a lot of time with him uh, and ended up becoming an investor. But at the time before that, we were building this financial model for a company that we were going to start. And the way I like to build models is I think that building models that are basically static or... Um, somewhat unsophisticated, meaning my P&L just says I'm going to 10% growth or whatever those numbers are. I think those things are, are a waste of time. And so what I normally do is build financial models at the very beginning. And those models will be monthly over the course of the first two to three years. And then after that, they will be quarterly. And then you know, in year five, they might be an annual, annual number. But, but what he showed me, and I've used this multiple times since then, is that oftentimes in a startup, one of your most significant costs is labor. And so what he did was he basically, he would always build a table. And this guy took three companies public in his career. Um, and so he knew exactly what he was doing. But he would put a table together, month one, month two, month three. He'd have job descriptions or types of jobs that you would need, specific overhead items that you might need every month. And then he would literally, every month that he brought in a new hire, he would start adding them in that table. And that table would populate your P&L automatically. He would do the same for the sales. How much sales could I do every month? What would be the growth rate of those sales? What are my assumptions? And I could change those assumptions. So I would create a data sheet for every financial model. I'll tell you that that one tool that he taught me has provided me more um, um, opportunity for success than anything else anyone's ever showed me because it allowed me to not only predict what I think the future may be, but also make adjustments based on what the future actually turns into me. So for example, I would create those models. I would put them on different sheets or different tabs or create a new file. And then if the six months into the company, things were a certain way, I would know those numbers. Those were actual numbers. And how did that change my cash flow requirements? How did that change my raise in the future? All of those kind of things. So my point is, if you can leverage people's experience, it can dramatically increase the likelihood to succeed. It also, entrepreneurship is a very lonely place. 
Um, because for your team, you have to be positive, even in the face of, of dire circumstance. You have to basically be a leader that's necessary in order for the company to succeed. Um, and yet, you may have imposter syndrome, you may struggle with certain aspects of the business. And so sometimes a mentor is the perfect person that you can talk to in that. My and, mentor is a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> like, he yeah. knows more about my business than my right. wife, my best right. friends. Like, right. he knows everything. Uh, so, yeah, totally. Uh, that really makes sense. Yeah, so Ken was talking about that his, his mentor, I'm just repeating for the group online. Um, his mentor is oftentimes his therapist, at least in your ability to be able to openly talk about your, yeah, what's happening. About yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so that's all I really have specifically around mentorship. Um, are there questions that you may have in terms of how to find we, them or others? Yeah, we actually yeah. do have a couple cool. of questions um, in the chat. And of course, we'll take some from the room. Uh, from Dustin, could you talk more on strategies, financial or equity startups use use for mentors. Oh, that's interesting. Do you, and that might mean when someone probably joins the board or if they get an equity ownership stake and in what probably what circumstances are those? So, um, so I'm gonna answer what I think the question is, but if it, but I'm not answering your question correctly, please reword it. Um, I, I'll tell you that- How to financially, he had it, how to financially incentivize. Yeah. Listen, that's a tough call. In my opinion, that's a tough call. Because to me, if you financially incentivize a mentor, they're no longer a mentor. They might be an advisory board member, they might be something else, but they're probably not a mentor. Why? Because in some ways, maybe the, the relationship is now different. You're providing them in some way, some sort of compensation, an option program or something like that to participate, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes that, that knocks the alignment of a mentorship relationship offline. To me, they would be more of an advisory board member that would basically you know, provide more practical advice about the business in terms of opening their network, or maybe they have expertise in a particular area of science that you need access to, but that's typically not someone, a mentor is typically not someone that you would provide some sort of financial reward for. It just biases the relationship. Um, and so be careful. I'm not saying it's impossible to get it right. I'm saying that if you try to reach out to a mentor and say, will you buy my be my mentor for options? I'm not sure you're gonna find the right person. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, just be careful that even, even any sort of compensation can bias. I'm not saying it will make it not work, but it can yeah. bias the relationship. So be careful yeah. for sure. Uh, and then Dustin, feel free to, to ping in if you need any additional, if you have additional context or wanna expand that question. Um, from Robert, uh, I need mentorship in writing a pitch deck that is concise, poignant, not so busy, delivers a clear message uh, of why we have the right renewable energy product in the right time for the world to build up solar farms. Where would I search for pitch writing? Well, in well, okay. So here's here's what here's some, several places that I would push you. The first place I would push you to is a lot of the programs that exist in whatever ecosystem that you're in. For example, Startup NV will have events on how to write a pitch deck, how to structure a pitch deck. I'll also tell you that there are a million examples online. And the reality is, is when you're building things like pitch decks, you just need to start because if you look at it in totality, it becomes overwhelming. And, and you just need to start and get something that you can get feedback on and make adjustments to. The other thing that Startup NV does as well is they'll provide feedback on your deck, right? You can submit a deck and they'll go through it with a panel of five or four or five people will go through it and provide you feedback on the quality of the deck and things that you may need to change. That's one another source. And then I'm going to be honest. I mean, in terms of getting a rough, a rough draft, sometimes I think just even something like a chat GPT session will at least allow you to get something on paper that you can then begin to edit. It may not be exactly like your company, but it allows you to start building it. And then finally, I think you can go and start up in V's website. I know why Common Area has as well, but I know Startup NV does as well. That's just a sample pitch deck that shows you what should be on each page. And you can use that to get started as well. So there's lots of resources available to start there for sure. Yeah. You just want to get something down that you can get feedback on and that gets you going. Yeah. And if you're looking for someone as, or a mentor to engage with you, and I mean, a lot of times that might come from your ecosystem. So attend our events, talk to, pe talk to people who have, and that will give you 10 and 15 minutes to sit down with you and have you go through a pitch and give you their honest feedback. There's definitely a lot of people that do that in this ecosystem that have pitched a number of times, raised capital uh, that are happy to provide insight. Um, from Richard, uh, 
what is a good way to manage uh, you know, your action steps when different mentors provide conflicting advice or action mm -hmm. steps? Oh. Well, listen, everyone has an opinion. Um, and opinions um, oftentimes differ. Sometimes I tell you know, startup founders, I said, you're going to go into a room with a group of investors. A third of the investors think you're a billion dollar opportunity. A third of the investors don't think you're going to make it till Friday. And the other third are trying to figure out what they're going to have for lunch. So the reality is, is that everyone has an opinion and mentors are the same way. Um, if you're managing conflict, first of all, if you've got too many mentors, that's ripe with conflict because more than likely there is going to be lots of opinions that may, may be conflicting. Um, but the other thing is, is that to me, you leverage the, the experience that the mentor, in other words, the mentor that has the most experience in the specific area in which you're getting advice from is the one that is the most credible. So if you've got conflicting advice between two mentors, you probably need to take the advice of someone who more specifically has done something specifically around the advice that you're getting. That would be the way I would approach it. The question was, how formal is the relationship between a mentor and mentee? Um, I, I would, and, and my answer is, is, in my opinion, it should never be contractual because that's not really a mentor. That's more of a consultant or something, somebody that you've engaged with to, to provide some sort of service. Um, it's more than likely um, informal in the sense that there's no specific contractual relationship, but formal in the sense that there's a structured process by which you communicate and meet. So you might say, um, look, I'm not sure how much time you can contribute, but, but I'm thinking uh, once, a, once a month for an hour, um, and if they say, well, I tell you what, I've got a little more time than I could probably do it every other week or something, then okay, great. You can kind of let them lead in terms of the time commitment. Um, so that's very structured. And in the way that you may communicate may be very structured. Um, you know, you email them every week to remind them, have a list of questions that you may even send them in advance of the meeting so that they can look through that list of questions before they meet. So those type of interactions will be very formal, but it won't be contractual because that's not a mentor, in my opinion. It's a good question though. Yeah, so let me, let me kind of wrap this up, so, or put a bow on it. Um, mentors can be incredibly important. They can teach you skills that will not only make you more effective in the current opportunity that you're working on, but you might use for years to come. I, I used an example with one of my partner, one of my um, um, friends who became an investor, who became a business partner, and he taught me in the way that he built some things that I still use. I literally was working on something the last six months and used that, all of that technique. I literally took the template, made tons of changes to it because it wasn't exactly right for what I was working on. But I used that on a regular basis. And he taught me how he used to do it. And it was incredibly insightful. So they can not only affect the potential success short term of your individual business. They can also affect outcomes in the future in the way that you do business and interact with your employees and be leaders and all these other kinds of things. But most importantly, in my opinion, oftentimes, as opposed to specific analytical or technical skills, they provide emotional support. They provide some level of confidence in the decisions that you're making because now someone who knows something about it has said, yeah, I think you're right. And then you can move forward with more confidence. And then finally, they can help you avoid major mistakes that may be fatal to your organization, right? And so the, for those reasons, I think that everyone should at least try to find a mentor. Now, it's hard because you're asking someone to commit their time to the relationship. Um, as I mentioned before, if you're somewhat clear in terms of the commitment and you follow specifically around those commitments or those time commitments and other things, I think the relationship will be fine. But sometimes it might take a little while. Personality difference sometimes are, are different. Um, the way that the style of communication may be very different. Um, and so it may take a little while to find a mentor that, that you think is a good fit. And also oftentimes good mentors aren't necessarily only around the specific opportunity that you're working on now. Over time, they become invested in you emotionally and in your individual success. And they may be mentors across multiple enterprises that you may start in your career. And so keep that in mind as well. And then finally, once that trust begins to build, you really start to value the information, not only that you receive in the literal sense, but also the support that you get from that relationship as well. So mentors are, mentors are valuable. They're, uh, they're in valuable in the sense that 
they can create value, but also valuable in the sense that they can help you along the way, both emotionally and in terms of the skills necessary. So I'd encourage you to find one. Don't get discouraged. Sometimes it takes a while to find the right one. Um, but in general, people that are successful can think about their own lives and careers and think of people that help them. And because of that, they want to help others. And so I think that's one of the best ways to do it as well. I was also going to ask, is it possible that you might have a series of uh, mentors depending on the stage you were in? You know, could I start with one? Okay, now I'm tra transitioning to a different phase of my project. Go to another, maybe go to another. I think it is, but I think sometimes the way to look at that is uh, those are more skill-based advisors, right? So I need some advice around a specific skill or a specific cycle in my business. Then that's, it can be a mentor. I mean, potato, potato, right? Or whatever, right? So it can be a mentor, but oftentimes those are just advisors to help me through this particular area. I think a mentor, I would think of as a, a little more holistic, right? They may not know exactly what your how to solve your specific problem but because of the trust that's been built up over time they might connect you with someone in their network that can help you with that specific thing right yeah. so that's the way i would think about it i think that having multiple mentors is not having a mentor is not exclusive to a single mm -hmm. relationship you i mean i've got two three uh, at least uh, and you know so you can have varying relationships with multiple mentors at the same time for various different components but yeah more holistic all right. Well, hey, everyone, thank you for joining us online and in person again. Uh, a record, and again, Leif, always appreciate it. Thank you so oh, much. Sure, of course. Thanks, Leif. Uh, a recording of this session will be made available by Sunday. Uh, also, it'll be available in the Founder University online portal, which all of you now have access to if you want. Uh, and a reminder, um, any attendee that attends, I believe, at least 80% of the series uh, you will get the help of the Startup Envy staff to set up your deal room. Deal room's very, your deal room is very important. This is the deliverable body of, of uh, information on your startup that you give access, an investor access to when they are considering making an investment. Uh, so it's really important to have it built out and yeah, easy to navigate and easy to deliver with all correct information so we can help, put that, help you put that together. Just remember to join us next week. We have Alicia Balde presenting about how to translate your pitch to an investor audience. So remember to join us at the same time next week, and we will see you then. All right, all. Take care. Thank you for coming.